Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're from. I'm joining you from Pune, India. With us, we have Clemens. Clemens calls New York his home, but I think right now he's in France. So uh, we do. We already have two continents amongst the two of us, and I'm sure our audience much more than that. Um, we, we are going to get started. So we are going to probably do 40, 45 minutes of uh, Clemens uh, taking us through his MBA journey, right from where he's coming from GMAT till his actual admit. And then uh, we can maybe spend the last 15 to 20 minutes taking question answers in the YouTube live chat section. So please keep your questions coming right from the start. And uh, towards the end, we'll start pinning them on the screen and Clemens will get to them. Cool. So Clemens, uh, do you want to take some time and just introduce yourself, who you are? Maybe yeah, three, four minutes. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, thank you uh, to GMAT Club. Uh, thank you, Tejas, uh, for moderating this session. Thank you to all those uh, who join. It's super exciting to be able to talk about this and to give back uh, some time to GMAT Club, which was super helpful in my preparation for the GMAT, uh, without a doubt. And uh, yeah, so to tell uh, you a little bit about my background, um, I was born in the US, but I grew up in France uh, in a city called Orleans. It's uh, 60 miles south of Paris. Uh, I did my high school. I did um, my high school in, in, in France. After graduating high school, I, I went to do my military obligation in Switzerland. Uh, I'm also a Swiss citizen from uh, my father, who's a Swiss citizen as well. Um, and I wanted to do something different after graduating high school. So I went to uh, the Swiss Army for uh, just under a year to, to do my military obligations. I went to, then I went to um, non-commissioned officer school and I taught the recruits um, the following, uh, you know, cycle, um, how to shoot a gun. And it was a pretty interesting experience. After that, I went uh, to do my undergrad in France. I went back to where my parents live in Orleans. Um, I did uh, foreign languages. And uh, uh, during my um, my uh, during my summer summer years uh, uh, at the undergrad school where I was, uh, I went to practice German in 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 Germany at an amusement park, and I was working at a restaurant of uh, of the amus of the amusement park. So that's where the flipping uh, burgers from flipping burgers. Um, to getting acceptance uh, letters at Haas, NYU, and Sloan. This is where the title comes from. Um, but it was just a summer job, um, nothing more than that. But it was a pretty fun uh, summer job, that's for sure. So after graduating um, from undergrad, foreign languages um, in English and, and German, I went to the US. Um, I went to do a master's degree, uh, uh, another master's degree at Boston College. Um, in finance and this was super helpful in getting a foothold in the u.s market i was able to um you know get uh, a first job in the u.s uh, in boston at state street and shortly after um i wanted to move to new york and i, I took an offer at credit agricole a french bank um at which i worked for the past uh, four years Okay, thank you. Uh, that's a, that's a lot. Uh, it's already France, Switzerland, Germany, <laughs> USA, four four countries before the MBA. <laughs> okay. Uh, so okay, I have a lot of questions then about your choice of schools. But before that, before that whole long process starts, we all need to get through the competitive exam. Now that's either the GMAT or the GRE. So uh, can you tell us both in terms of how long you took and what was your approach? Did you give it once, twice? Uh, did you give it two years before the joining date? Yeah, absolutely. So the GMAT, uh, yeah, I, I I put a lot of importance on the GMAT. Um, from what I've heard uh, from the uh, some you know reading reading on the GMAT club, reading on some articles from you know those uh, consulting firms that work for uh, people who want to do MBAs. We hear that it can be anywhere from twenty to thirty percent. So obviously it's pretty big weight. Um, so I wanted to take a, a, a lot of time. Um, I was lucky enough to, um, I mean, I, 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 it's not really luck, but I worked on the GMAT uh, in 2014 when I was working on my uh, master's, uh, my first master in finance uh, application at Boston College. So I had some um, some uh, background already, but for this second journey uh, for, for uh, my uh, MBA applications, I... Um, basically set up to spend about an hundred hours 
on the GMAT. Um, over from May to end of July of 2020, um, obviously working remotely really helped. Uh, in you know when I have a spare some spare time, I was able to, yeah. to do a couple of questions. I used Magouche, um, but I mean I guess to start from the beginning, I think it's really important to have a, a study plan um, and see you know read all the. Uh, you know, official guides, um, do the questions. Obviously, if you feel like you need um, to to practice uh, or to, to do the, to go over the lessons again before practicing, I think um, I definitely do that. I used uh, MGMAT, Manhattan GMAT in 2014. It was great. I did Magouche in 2020 for, for the second um I think both have, you know, pros and cons. Uh, either one of them is great. I don't think you need both, but definitely uh, go through all the um, uh, all the questions that you can. Um, and um, I think uh, the GMAT Club has excellent resources, uh, a lot of uh, free tests that you can do. And um, I think that uh, the most important at some point when you start stagnating, I think you need, what I did at least, um, I did some um, hard questions, both you know verbal and quant, and the GMAT club has all the hard questions and the best, uh, the best hard questions. Once you um, work on those hard questions, I felt like, at least in my experience, it, it, it felt like a, the other regular questions felt much um, easier. So, you know, study plan, uh, practice a lot, uh, work on your weak areas, um, and use all the free resources that uh, the, the official GMAT has. Um, and you can buy even some uh, CAT uh, computer adaptive tests that are really the most, um, you know, close to what the real test experience is. Yeah, I totally agree. A lot of people don't realize, I think, initially that in GMAT Club, you can even filter the test source. You can only practice OG if you need to, only about critical reasoning, uh, only 700 plus level questions. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of resources for someone who wants to get the free stuff. Uh, and to recap, you did this last year in May to July, so about a year before uh, you're actually joining. And I want to <laughs> reiterate, in case we missed this in the start, that Clemens is joining MIT Sloan. Correct me, are you joined or you're going to be joining next month? I'm pretty sure it's very close. Uh, yeah, I'm matriculating in, um, in next week, actually. The matriculation is next week, officially. Next week. Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, I applied uh, to all the schools I applied to, I applied round one uh, of last year. Okay. So I was, you know, starting, you know, September. Uh, the, the, the first deadlines were early September, then yeah. uh, all to October, mid October for NYU, which was the latest one. Right, I, th I think this year's deadlines are beginning September 7th, uh, pretty close, yes. So, um, okay. It's coming up, yeah. We, we, um, you also, you were working in finance, you were working in credit agricole. So it was a technical field, but there are often a lot of us who are working in marketing or uh, maybe with an airline pilot or something like that, where we are not doing maths on a daily basis. So do you want to give some advice for someone who is coming back to GMAT after five years of working in the industry and is now just not seen a test in five years? Uh, yeah, I think um, going through, uh, so there's a lot of triangles and circles questions that uh, I think nobody really uses in their field. So... Uh, <laughs> To start, to start over, or just to go back to an exam, it's definitely helpful to read uh, the um, any study guide you choose. So in my case, uh, I think uh, the, the, the first time was Manhattan uh, GMAT prep. And I, I read through the materials and the triangles, all the math stuff. Um, I think you, you, know, you have to put yourself in a mentality to, you're going back to school, so you have to, uh, practice at least that that's what I did um, and give yourself time it's much easier to have the flexibility um, of having the time uh, to study when you need if you need to surge if you need even more time you you know give yourself some time so it's better to stretch it over a longer period of month then you can uh, adapt if you feel like you need to accelerate um, I think if you can, 
just uh, plan to do one test because um, it's nerve wracking to go through the process twice. Um, but in case you need to do a second test, you know, give yourself a month between the deadline. So in 2020, for example, I did my test end of July. In theory, I could have taken it again end of August for to meet the September deadlines um, if I needed to. Uh, fortunately, uh, I you know I was my score was um, I guess good enough not to not to not to for me to think that I needed to take it to take again to increase my chances or it would be would have been really hard to increase my chances dramatically with the GMAT. and I preferred to work on my other areas of the uh, application, but. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, take the time to study. Um, if you feel like you study uh, well enough on your own, um, the GMAT, uh, you know, the MGMAT or Magush is great. Magush has a video, which is an added, you know, benefit for people who need to hear. Um, I guess the things said, um, the lessons, materials that um, recited to them. That's helpful. Um, if you need, if you feel like you need uh, somebody to a coach to to, um, uh, you know, to um, I guess report to or or to help you uh, study, then it's something to consider. But um, uh, yeah, I think the time is crucial, and um, and making the time to read definitely, uh, I think the okay. most helpful. Yeah, uh, that's cool. Um, OK, before we move on to the schools part, I want to remind everyone that those of you who are joining us live, you have the advantage of actually asking your questions. So I'm going to move over the GMAT part now, but do keep questions about the GMAT in the chat, and we'll take them in the last 20 minutes. Um, so Clemens, about school selection, um, you did your master's in the US itself, um, mm -hmm. but you all did, had, since you were from France, you have the visibility of NCR, London Business School, HEC Paris. So uh, can you talk about geographies? You had good schools in your home continent and in the one you were working in. So how did you choose? Uh, sure, that's a great question. I think um, the way I looked at the school geographies is really um, where I want to be, where I want to work, uh, because um, what I what I what I start a you know what I have in mind is that you go to school you have this network of people that you know are also most likely going to find work at least in the country where the school is so um, you know a a MIT or or NYU NYU is super super New York focused actually perhaps more than any other school um, MIT has a big uh, you know hub is a big hub in the Northeast but also on the West Coast. And um, Haas is a big hub for the West Coast as well. So I didn't really consider uh, European schools um, because it was, uh, you know, I didn't want it. I didn't want to go back to Europe to work. I want to stay in the U.S. So for me, it made sense to to uh, go to do an MBA to to do an MBA in the U.S. And um, yeah, I think that's uh, okay. That's one thing, and the second thing is that the application process is a little different. So the like letters of recommendation are different. So if you're thinking about how to maximize your, you know, your um, uh, your scale, you can't really do this uh, because uh, it's it's a little different uh, application process. <laughs> okay. And I've heard, I don't know how true this is, that the, even the class profile is usually different, the style of teaching, the average age of the class and stuff. Anyway, uh, so oh, yeah, makes sense. now you've just talked about Haas being a West Coast, uh, Columbia Stern being so NYC focused. How did you decide then to go to MIT Sloan? Sure. What, what so, you to Boston? Absolutely. So there's multiple things that I took into consideration. The first is, um, and I guess give you to give the people on, the, on this um, live a, a little bit more background, I was interested in, in working in renewable energy, uh, more precisely as a developer of renewable energy. At Credit Agricole, I worked in project finance, and we um, financed a lot of the you know uh, renewable projects around the US that um, are being developed. And we also did a lot of oil and gas, but I wanted to focus more um, on renewables to feel like you know making a positive impact on the planet, um, and uh, also to be on the equity side. So MIT has a big uh, program in sustainability. They have um, you know excellent uh, class uh, classes in energy policy and um, uh, action learning classes that 
really help to get a better grasp grasp of um, how the I guess the energy environment works. And um, I, I I also looked at the the international rankings. Um, obviously, Haas is a excellent uh you know renewable program as well yeah uh on the west coast and and i i think you know and ultimately i i went with it was a difficult choice because i don't really like the weather in in boston compared to uh berkeley uh, but ultimately um i thought that if i wanted to go back to france you know five ten years from now um MIT might have a, a better international uh, impact or, or even a brand, we could say. Mm. And um, it, I also wanted to stay on the East Coast uh, because my family is in Europe and wanted to stay a little closer. Okay, yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, how did you uh, how did you go up this research process of discovering that Haas and uh, MIT have sustainability programs, the different methods? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it wasn't you know necessarily obvious, especially uh, you know not knowing anybody who had gone to those schools. So what I looked at, uh, I looked at the top schools. I looked at uh, the marketing materials of all those schools. Um, um, pretty much uh, you know going through the websites, and once I had selected the uh, the schools I wanted to apply to, I. I talked to the students, and I think this is really important um, in in better in being able to target the school very well, because the people will tell you things that you can't necessarily see in the marketing materials. Um, Veritas also has um, a, a good uh, overview of the different schools, what makes the schools unique. So I think that's a good resource that I looked at when I was doing my applications, but. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, just going through the um, different offering of the schools, um, this is how it, it's, a, it's a lot of work, but um, ultimately, uh, that's how you, you see what uh, each school is about. Yeah, you're right. A lot of schools have the similar offerings also often, and only when you talk to students, you know, that how, vertic <laughs> how vertically deep is that offering really? Uh, is it just an offering for the sake of an offering? Yeah. Exactly, um, exactly. Okay, so how did you, you applied in round one? Uh, can you tell us how many schools you chose to apply to and um, what was the process of, was there overlap in the essays and stuff like that? Sure, so I applied to six schools um, uh, and uh, there, was, there was a good amount of overlap. Um, I would have applied to Wharton too, uh, and for the same reason I mentioned uh, earlier, because of the scale, the recommendation for Wharton was completely different than the other six schools that I applied to, and so I didn't I didn't end up applying to Wharton, which is fine. But um, I, I, it's not some it's it wasn't in, really in my target school, but um, it's just something that I was thinking about in my strategy. How do you maximize you know your your uh, material? How do you maximize your chances to being accepted somewhere? with using the same material and doing mm -hmm. the minimum amount of work. I mean, there is always a lot of work involved. The essays in particular are um, very different uh, from one school and to another. Of course, sometimes you can recycle one paragraph, but for the most part, you they do it so that um, you have to, um, to write your essays, especially for the school, which which is fine. And and it, doing so really also helps you learn more about the school and learn more about whether you're interested in joining in joining the school. And so as I, every act, I, every time I was putting together my application, I was really uh, so excited about this school. I was like, "Oh my god, this is the best school ever!" And I, and I was really, you know. Um, uh, getting myself excited for each of those schools. And um, it, it, it is also helpful that they don't have the uh, deadlines all at the same dates. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to do that. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. And uh, the, as you said, they, I, I think, so the, they claim the essays represent the brand qualities of the school, which is true. Uh, but then also, they're so different. If you, you would have seen Berkeley Haas asks you, what makes you feel the most alive and why? And then uh, <laughs> Columbia will ask you, tell me about your favorite song. Uh, and there's not much scope for overlap. How much ever you think that I will, my six schools will have 50% overlap, it may not be the case. Exactly. Yeah, we exactly. need to keep time for that. Um, 
Okay, and for yeah, MIT had who, a. Hmm? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you mentioned that Wharton's uh, recommendation was different, and hence you chose not to do it. But I have the. Uh, I have this opinion that MIT's whole application process is itself different with the org chart yeah. favorite visualization, which no one else asked for. So can you comment on then how come you went with MIT? You really love the school that much, is it? Um, <laughs> I, I think, uh, yeah, I was willing to spend a lot of time on the MIT application because it was uh, you know, my favorite school. Um, I it, it's, it's interesting. It was an interesting exercise and I had fun with it. Uh, I, I, I'm a more, I guess, quantitative person. And so doing an org chart was easier to me <laughs> than doing uh, an essay. And the essay was very short, actually. I think it's 300 words and it's more professional. Um, it's, a, it's, it's supposed to be a cover letter. So it's a more professional style letter, not so much, um, you know, creative, um, not so much of a creative uh, letter, more about your achievement because they're the minds, the, I guess the ethos of, of MIT is mind and hand. So um, it's about achievements. This is what they, this is why their application process is so different because they want to see that you've achieved something. Um, and everybody can talk about you know something they they achieved, and I think that's uh, the, it was a very interesting uh, application to work on. And they also asked for a video, which was um, a one minute video, uh, and that was uh, yeah a lot of takes before I got <laughs> the right one. And then I looked on on YouTube. My my setting my setting was really boring. I had a tie on. I was in my apartment, and then I saw on YouTube a lot of people went to in the park or like. Uh, you know, in the top of the Grand Canyon or like crazy things like that. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so boring. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. That's a good point. Now we'll remember to look it up on YouTube, get some inspiration also <laughs> for us, not that it might be needed. And yeah, I agree with you that MIT also, even I'm an engineer and it gives me some uh, reassurance because they have this whole mathematical method of shortlisting where they score you and plot a graph and then pick the people for interviews and stuff. And not just uh, under the umbrella of holistic like uh, many other schools. OK. Um, so now after you're done with this, you obviously would have got a lot of interviews. Can you tell us what we don't know? Those of us who are right now writing our essays, what we should be expecting once we submit that with respect to interviews? Yeah, sure. So the, the, um, the interviews, uh, I, I received my interview invite, invitation on the last date that they were sending the interview invite. So I thought, in my mind, I had already lost the opportunity. But um, when I scheduled the interview date, I put my le the latest, the furthest away possible, my, the date in the calendar. And that was, I think, two days um, before they give out the decision. Um, and I did so because I wanted to have a lot of time to talk to people, to prepare my interviews and do others other interviews for, for other schools as a sort of a, a prep. Uh, I was really, uh, you know, lucky to meet somebody that spent the time to do a mock-up interview. Um, I met this guy through a friend of a friend. He he went to Booth. Um, he gave me some uh, insights, and he spent, uh, you know, an hour doing a mock-up interview with me, giving me the feedback. So that was really helpful. I think connecting with people that are the school that are the school that you're interested in, and I mean, not even people that are doing an MBA, they can give you good advice as well. Um, and uh, friends that you meet, you can meet them on LinkedIn, you can meet them on GMAT Club, you can, there's so many places where you can meet them. Some schools have student ambassadors. Uh, if you would attend those, um, admit uh, those, uh, you know, admissions um, events, um, you you can uh, see how, you uh, uh, you can see, uh, you know, who's who, who to talk to and how to approach the interviews. In my personal, um, in my personal uh, experience with MIT, um, the questions were really focused. In, uh, the way I guess I, I'll take take a step back and tell you what I prepared. What I prepared was my story, polishing my um, achievements. I read on GMAT Club that uh, they were asking a lot about personal achievements. Um, again 
because of the same uh, the same uh, uh, ethos of, of MIT uh, focused about what you achieve in the past as, as a prediction for your future, for your future success. Uh, so I prepared some good stories. I had some stories uh, of how I, uh, you know, change processes at my firm. Um, I also um, saw that on GMAT Club as well, that they were asking what has changed since you last submitted your application. So I made sure that I had some interesting new stories um, to share when the interview started. So I interviewed with the assistant dean, um, and it was it was it was a a lot, you know, the structure that I expected. What did you achieve recently? Um, what was uh, you know what what is your biggest work achievement or something like that? And what I guess took me by surprise is that uh, the interviewer was going into a lot of details into exactly what I did, exactly my, inv to find my exact involvement. Um, so you need, basically, if, as you prepare for the MIT interview in particular, that was, you know, much more in detail than other school interviews. Um, they just don't want to see the surface, but if you're going through a story, they will want a lot of detail. So make sure okay. it's fresh in your mind. And um, I'm also, you know, sending out my, uh, I'm, 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 um, Providing my application materials for uh, Sloan, for Haas, for uh, NYU. So feel free to to reach out uh, um, with any uh, you know questions on my application materials. Uh, okay, that looks really helpful. Uh, so even the but not all interviews are the same. At least that's what I've read. That some of them are the, where they read everything about you and come. Some of them, they have only a resume, and some don't even look at your resume. They just show up to the video call and talk to you. So uh, is there, do, you, do you change the strategy based on that? And um, yeah, OK, let's absolutely. cover that first. Yeah, absolutely. So I think one, well, they, the school interviews are very different. And the interviewers are very different. Yes. You can, they, sometimes you have to, you deal with alumni. Um, and those can be, you know, two years, three years out of school. So they are generally pretty, uh, you know, approachable. Um, or you deal with admissions uh, professionals that are, you know, a little bit, uh, I guess, more um, no bullshit mentality because you know they've they've they're veterans. Uh, for NYU and MIT, I, I both had an admissions uh, professional, um, and in. Those two cases, they had uh, a lot of my background. They read uh, a lot of my uh, they read all the materials that I had provided. So it, it felt a, a little bit more in depth. Um, uh, the interview that I had with Chicago Booth, um, I was waited, wait listed at Chicago Booth, um, by the way. But uh, the interview I had uh, as, another, as another example with Chicago Booth, uh, the interviewer didn't have much uh, background, I think, on, on my application and the just uh, you know, ask the questions that they have on the grid. But um, as a good uh, you know uh, MBA uh, prep uh, interview prep uh, on GMAT Club, the, there's a lot of uh, people who provide their questions that they the questions that they received on the interviews for each different school, and um, you will always you know talk about your background, why you want to do an MBA, and why this school. That's kind of the standard that you can. Uh, prepare for in any case, but there can be some little differences here and there uh, depending on the school. So definitely check out GMAT Club for that. Yeah, yeah. Just like I think people post the GMAT debrief about how the exam went and how difficulty. I think people are posting interview debrief for each school. Correct. And also, I wanted to again repeat the point you said that uh, often they're helping. Uh, they are willing to even take thirty minutes and do a mock interview of you. And I think it helps if you already have made a warm connection during your application research process, and then you can say that, hi, we spoke two months ago. It was really helpful. Now, can you just get me over the final step? Yeah, cool. Absolutely. Now, the last part of the application process uh, is the recommendation, which is not in our hands, really, uh, beyond a point. So can you tell us what is in our hands and how should we go about talking <laughs> to a recommender? And when should we reach out? Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, it's a great question. Um, and honestly, there's so many things I would have done differently uh, with the recommendation. And and I think I think to me this was the most uh, stressful part because you have no control over 
uh, how timely your recommenders are, how willing to cooperate your recommenders are. And I had some surprises, uh, you know, one recommender that sort of dropped the ball in the middle. Um, and uh, I thought that uh, this person was really, uh, you know, supportive and, and, and very nice. So there are some surprises with recommendations. And I think um, one thing that I wish I had done, uh, you know, once you think about your, think about your MBA, um, you know, start to talk with the people that you want to use as a recommendation. Ask them their advice about the MBA. Ask them, I guess this is a more general question for like how to deal with people in general, but definitely, you know, um, innocently ask around to those people that you want to have as a recommendation. What do you think I should, should I do an MBA? Uh, um, try to bring the topic uh, in a very, uh, you know, innocent manner and, and, and do it in advance. Um, I did it a month in advance before the, you know, the first deadlines. I think that was too short. Um, I wish I had done it maybe a year ago, something, you know, that you show that you thought about it. Um, a, a long time in advance, uh, but obviously, uh, you know, uh, it, it doesn't really matter um, if you do it, um, uh, you know, if you don't do it so much in advance. It, it's just if you have the luxury of having this much time, definitely do it. Yeah. Um, one more thing on the recommenders. Um, I was really unlucky because the person I wanted to use two recommender, one eventually retired and the second uh, unexpectedly passed away last year, right before I started to submit my application. So I had to think about, uh, you know, other recommenders and my first applications, I had, I guess, uh, used, I asked some people that were still in the company at Credit Agricole uh, to provide their recommendations. And, um, and, um, I, I guess I could I could have done better. I, I and then I, I I realized that I could have done better. I went back to my old boss who retired. He was uh, you know the head of the agency middle office where I had spent two years um, at Credit Agricole, my two first years, um, and he was happy to help. And at first I didn't want to you know have him as a recommender because he retired, but you know that does it doesn't matter. A, a, a retiree is also a good re recommendation. They might call him back because he has a, you know, a Gmail address or something, but um, definitely uh, I think, uh, I guess, long story short, uh, as, as you think of recommenders, um, uh, choose somebody that can speak very positively about you, but, you know, very, uh, you know, that, that knows your qualities that can make you stand out because I think that really matters. And also choose the people that are, you know, have a, a good title, but, but those people that have a good title, they need, they need to know you. Otherwise it might not be uh, genuine and, and it will not necessarily help you stand out. But this very good recommender that I had I wrote really personal things that, you know, only apply to me. And I think that helped me a lot. Okay. Yeah, I've heard that similar feedback from the admission committee. That, it, oh, what I also oh, heard interesting. To, to just, I can't hear you any anymore. Um, um, am I fine? Am I, I might need my headphones. I think so. Sorry, let me try to. Yeah, you can go ahead. Meanwhile, I was telling the audience that uh, I even heard this recently from one of the admission committees that. You choosing a recommender is also a sign of is what we are looking at. That um, it shows your EQ. It shows how good a judge of character you are. So um, that's sorry, yeah, I lost you for a good minute here. My... No, no, that, that, that's all right. Uh, that, that's no problem. I was just telling, sharing some insights of my own. Um, okay, awesome. I and one thing I wanted to ask you and add is that I'm seeing in most of the recommendations they uh, ask how did this applicant receive feedback and did they act on the feedback? So um, they, I, I, like I'm looking at recommendations and I'm thinking that, oh, I never ve went through a whole feedback loop with this person. So what will we write in this question? Did you have to think of that? So yeah, that's a great point. Uh, and again, I think uh, if you have the luxury of time, if you're really ahead in your schedule and in doing an MBA, that's something that you can plan ahead and, and ask your um, potential recommenders what what the what feedback they may have. And I think in general, as an employee, it's always good practice to ask for feedback often. Um, 
at least at Credit Agricole, we had a uh, performance review every year. If, every year is, is, is uh, you know, 12 months, a lot of time. I think uh, I, I would ask for feedback at least quarterly. Um, but yeah, in the case of my recommenders, I was really ha happy, uh, you know, to uh, have some feedback that I've some stories to share um, and some stories that we could use, uh, you know, it, it, uh, for in, to address the, this this particular question. Um, of course, it, it required, you know, some discussion. You, you know, uh, we, me and my recommenders, we talked on the phone to discuss what story would be good. Um, and sometimes, yeah. you know, you have to to nudge them a little bit, uh, especially uh, you know, experienced people. They f they forget a lot. Like, oh, what year did you start? Oh, you started in twenty twelve. No, I like, <laughs> I wasn't even in the workforce in twenty twelve. So you know, there's. <laughs> You got to keep them in uh, in their boundaries a little bit, but um, it definitely uh, has. It's good to you know communicate a lot with your recommenders ahead of time if you can, and if you if you have to you know um, uh, go back and discuss what story you could use. Uh, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's good to as a recommender you should choose uh, uh, recommenders that definitely uh, you that are reachable that you can spend some time to talk with them to help so they can help you definitely and for anyone who is watching this and does have that luxury of time make sure that in your year end or in your mid yearly review at least if you're not doing it quarterly as clemens is suggesting that you show <laughs> that you have acted on feedback in a very <laughs> rounded fashion okay um <laughs> it, 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 you talked about research and sustainability initiatives in the schools. Uh, did rankings matter? You said that you valued MIT Sloan also for the brand name. So how much did rankings feature in your decision? Um, I think the, yeah, the rankings were, um, I think pretty, uh, I relied a lot on the on the rankings. I think uh, in my business called research, at least uh, I was uh, mostly interested in, in doing, a, you know, um, I guess, tier one school or N7, as you would say, or, and so I, I sort of ca casted a net and it, it, some, um, you know, some, some people call it differently. People say like you, you, you cast a net that includes your reach schools. Uh, so schools that you have, yeah, your chances are, are, are not so high, but you, it's worth to worth, worth a shot. And then some schools that are, um, you know, well in, into your your um, category, and 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 I think the best indicator for that is um, it's it, not necessarily the GMAT score, but the GMAT score and the I guess your your work experience and the and the and the profile. To be honest, I didn't think that I would be accepted at 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 those schools because um, credit I would call I didn't think was um, uh, seen as a you know reputable bank especially because it's a french bank and i was applying to american schools but i was uh you know surprised to see that um you know there was no uh i guess no judgment on the part of those schools and they 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 took um they they took my experience seriously uh, um at a french bank so definitely uh don't need to work at an american company um <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah so the rankings uh i i mostly um i i i, I sort of cast a net that was you know uh schools that i'm that i was not i don't want to say sure to get in but had good chance to get in but in some schools that i probably wouldn't get in so you have a you know a good spectrum i i applied to six school i think that's too many um oh. definitely four for uh, it's probably the the max. Okay, um, I think this question everyone asks themselves and spends a lot of time thinking about that. Which school am I? Which is reach for me, and which what might be your reach may not be my reach, or vice versa. So, how did you decide that? Did you just look at the average GMAT and the age and these class profile statistics, or something else also? Um, so I did those actual um, profiling tests. Uh, that some uh, websites, pro like some consultant uh, admissions consul uh, consultants provide. Um, I can find the link um, uh, if you'd like, but it, 
I was basically, it was looking at your work experience. It looked at your uh, GMAT score. It looked at your um, extracurriculars, awards, essays, recommenders. And a lot of it is judgment. So, uh, you know, for example, the, the those websites that sort of do um, an algorithm to um, tell you which school you should apply to, they they ask you, how do you think your essay is? Is it average? Is it above average? Is it below average? So I yeah. sort of did some, you know, different sort of scenarios. And um, it was saying that, uh, you know, I wasn't even, uh, uh, MIT wasn't even within my reach. So I I, I still wanted to ap apply to uh, schools that were, you know, at the top tier and um, see what stick. And, um I, I, yeah, I guess that was my indicator, and and so I guess it, don't necessarily trust what those <laughs> background uh, algorithm tell you. Uh, I think uh, you can uh, you can do it. Anybody can do it. Um, if I can do it, uh, flipping burgers, uh, anybody can. Do it. <laughs> flipping burgers, Swiss Army. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you, if you're going to apply to four schools, you'd have probably definitely chosen all four in round one because that looks like a manageable uh, workload. But um, yeah. would you think round two affects your chances or how comfortable were you with waiting for round two, maybe if you had to give GMAT a second time? Absolutely. Um, so I think, uh, well, so I'm a... I'm more of a quant guy, so obviously I looked at the statistics, what I could find on the internet. GMAT Club has a lot of statistics, actually. Uh, yeah with a lot of uh, data that was compiled from previous people uh, is really helpful. And I think what what turns out for some schools, round one um, gives you a good, a better chance to get in than round two. Uh, and this is why I wanted to go in round one. Um, it's not necessarily the case for all schools. Some schools are, you know, similar. I don't know, like 30% uh, round one, 30% you know, um, acceptance rate on round one, 30% acceptance rate on round two. So it depends by school. Uh, but uh, for, I think most schools, round one is, um, I don't want to say necessarily less competitive, uh, but the, the acceptance rate is, 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 is usually higher. Um, so definitely you check the statistics for the schools you, you would like to do, um, you would like to apply to. Um, I think round one, I, I like the idea of round one also because it shows that, you know, you've put the work and yeah. you're, you're first in line. You're like, um, you know, it shows that you wanted to do an MBA for a long time. And, and yeah. it, it, it was, you know, um, it was matching the image that I wanted to portray. So okay. that's how I decided. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, for GMAT club does have a lot of good statistics. I think even, Sometimes the class profile that you see is an average of the 400 students in the class, but maybe you want to see people with three years work experience who are like you or someone who is from uh, your nationality. And then GMAT Club does give you that specific class profile also from actual past students. Cool. Um, my last question about school selection is that clubs, uh, did you find them to be very similar across schools or? Was the did MIT have something really good and Berkeley had some excelled at something else? I think uh, yeah. For that's that's another great question. I think for the um, the professional clubs, it's very important uh, to go. And this is why the specialty of the school matters. Um, Has and MIT uh, for sustainability. They're they're I think the best, and they both have a really uh, strong energy club. Um, Has is I think the biggest actually. Um, so how I got to know about the the those clubs. So I guess first of all, I mean professional clubs. You 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 uh, you rely a lot on them to, for networking. You rely a lot on them to meet people that are. Uh, you know, similar, like-minded, they are interested in the same things, but you also do lunch and learns. You also uh, meet professionals that come to the campus that talk about the industry. So it's a great way to network and put your name out um, uh, for the for those professionals to to get a foot in the door of the companies that uh, come in to the 
club to discuss. So that's why clubs are significant in uh, facilitating the you know the, the the interview or the recruitment process. Uh, so as it relates to my particular experience, the I learned about the clubs um, uh, at Haas and MIT that are big um, energy clubs. I found the I found about those online. And for Haas, I was really lucky to be able to connect with a energy club uh, student who gave me a lot of info about what the club does. And to be honest, I think this club is the best energy club in, in North America. But, um, um, you know, all things considered, uh, I, I ended up going at MIT. MIT has a really good energy club as well. They do a um, energy hack event. Um, I'm working on the marketing for this event, actually. Um, they do the energy, uh, um, the yearly energy conference, which is a pretty well uh, attended event as well. So, yeah, in short, uh, you know, professional clubs uh, play a huge role in the, in the recruitment. So I think um, uh, look at the, uh, look on the website if you can see what info you have, and definitely talk to the students who are in those clubs that you're interested in. I think that's the best way to learn yeah. about what the clubs does. And all those websites list out specifically the club members, the leadership committee of this year, which you can reach out to. Did you mention exactly. you were work, you're working on marketing for this club already? Is that? Uh, yeah, I think. You're not, uh, yet, not yet started at school and you're already working on the club. <laughs> and I'm not even the worst yet. There are some uh, who are uh, president of the, <laughs> well, the president of the Energy Hack is uh, also an incoming student. So not technically in school yet but already involved. Um, so what's great is that we had this Slack channel and we were able to connect with a lot of the current student. And so the current students would post for incoming students uh, some leadership openings. And so a lot of the incoming students applied for um, leadership positions. And I think it's a great way to get some meaningful experience and get to learn people, get to know people. So I wanted to I wanted to get involved and, and I'm, um yeah on the marketing for the energy hack uh for 2021 yeah okay um all right uh thanks so much i we still have around 12 minutes so i'm gonna quickly go to question answers there are some 20-ish questions here and uh if anyone else has anything after hearing so much from clemens please put that in quickly we'll uh, definitely try to run through all of them so uh, i see a question about Someone is saying that they're very early in their career and they gave GMAT, they got a 760, which is an amazing score. And they're worried that do they, should they be giving it again in four years or so when they're going for the MBA or uh, can they just reuse this? Will the school look down that the score is three years old, four years old? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the school is not gonna, it's not gonna, it's just gonna take the score at its face value. And uh, the likelihood is that they're not even gonna realize that it's four years old because once you put it in the system, um, you just put your score. You don't necessarily put in the date. Well, I guess some some places ask for the date, but um, in any case, I, I don't think it it will be discriminating uh, if you put uh, an old score as long as it's not you know more than five years old. I think that's the the score needs to be at least five years. Um, uh, but if if no, I don't think it will be an issue. Um, okay. Cool. Um... Okay, Anjum is asking, how do you know MIT is the right place for you? But I think you covered that, that the sustainability and the East Coast closer to home, uh, et cetera. Okay. Exactly. So, uh, someone's asking about a second MBA. Uh, I know you have not done a uh, MBA before this, but you have done a master's in finance. Uh, so they're asking, how do they, how should they look at the application in the GMAT school when they are coming, having done another, another MBA? I know a lot of people from India sometimes consider doing that because uh, what we call an MBA is often a PGDM course in India. So um, I don't know, maybe the person's coming from there. Can you comment about a second master's degree in management? Yeah, I think um, it it doesn't matter really if you already have a graduate degree uh, and you want to do an, M an MBA. I think what matters a lot is whether you can get um, you know, value out of it. And I think if you're a good applicant, any school will tell you to come in uh, and accept you um, even if you don't really need it. So the question is really, um, what else do you 
can you take out of the MBA program that wasn't covered in your uh, in your previous graduate degree? I think mm -hmm. that um, in the case, I mean, all business schools have so much to offer in basically any any course. I think uh, at least at MIT, we can take courses of. Oh, well, there is a limitation. You can take only three courses that are outside of the business school, but you can take within the business school. There's so many things that are new and that justify you doing an MBA. I can just think of you know innovation classes, entrepreneurship classes, um, you know energy specific classes, corporate finance, marketing, and I'm just thinking of finance stuff. But there's you know marketing. There is all the really the different. Um, um, you know, fields of the business that, you know, you can learn more mm -hmm. and um, you can uh, even, you know, take PhD level classes potentially in, in if you want to really push um, or data analytics classes or even programming classes that are offered within the business school. So I think, uh, you know, as long as you can justify uh, um, the value that the MBA can be uh, to you uh, through classes, networking, or location, I think that's totally um, totally worth it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. location also being very important, cool. Um, we have a question from Wahid. Um, Wahid has a lot of experience, it's amazing. Uh, he's an engineer, 17 years of work experience, and he wants to know that, uh, does it make sense to do an MBA, or do you suggest anything else he can also look at? I think that's a good question. Um, from what I've heard, at least, uh, you know, you'll have, a, in an MBA class, you'll typically have three to five years of experience, depending on what school. Some schools have, you know, more two years, and other schools might have more five years. Um, I know that MIT and Haas have mostly four to five rather than two to three. Uh, I think it's pretty rare for people that have that much experience to do an MBA because you'll be with people that hardly have any experience. I mean, the people that do an MBA, they're, you know, don't have a lot of experience. So they, they might, you know, sound um, young to you. Uh, they might sound, you know, a little bit, I guess, uh, you know, very junior, which is uh, with reason with 17 years of experience, you will be more senior. So I think what I've heard and, you know, I mean, totally double check me on that and definitely do your own research. But I would think of doing a, you know, um, MBA fellow program or an, an executive MBA. There's a lot of programs that are designed for people that have good experience already um, and that, you know, might need different skills than than those that are, you know, just starting really in the career. Um, so that's my advice. But um, I think, you know, MBAs have a lot of unique cases. And if, you know, an MBA would be right for you for, X, Y, Z, yeah, then why not? But uh, definitely re research also uh, executive MBAs as well. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Um, this question, good question, Mr. Radio Lunatic. Uh, can you talk about the extracurriculars? I'm low in that section and we did not hear from you. Uh, is there anything you're doing on the side also? Oh yeah, so that's a great question. I wanted to talk about this too. Uh, I know there's so many to talk about in admissions and an hour is, is not that long actually. So extracurricular I think is very important for the business school, especially the, the top business school because then they offer you for an opportunity to differentiate yourself. Um, and again, this is so easy if you're five years ahead of time because you can, uh, if you're, you know, the luxury of time again, if you're five years ahead of time, you're like, okay, I'm going to do every year, 20 years, uh, 20, sorry, every year, I'm going to do 20 hours of, uh, volunteering work. Um, so if you're not in this case, uh, you can do, uh, a one or two week vacation and do volunteer work. And I mean, that's an idea. Actually, that's what I did. Um, some years ago in 2017, I did, uh, a week of teaching English in Mexico. And periodically I worked as a volunteer with my firm, um, uh, but I was, you know, only a couple of hours a year and I did, uh, you know, feeding the homeless with um, an organization in New York. All in all, maybe I had, uh, I don't know, 30 hours of volunteering in the past five years. Um, so it's not a lot. I wish I had mo had more, and um, I guess you know my 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 answer to this. Yes, I think uh, extracurricular is very important for top tier schools, 
And if you if there is a way for you to catch up, if you don't have that much time uh, ahead, um, then you can you know potentially do a long um, a one week, two weeks, three weeks uh, volunteer work abroad. And there are some programs you can Google them um, that can you know ship you uh, uh, in Mexico. That's where I did it in Vietnam. But there's a lot of destinations. Mm. That's interesting. I never thought of taking time off to do that. Um, it's also like a break from work, and you are doing your extracurriculars, and also it's it it could very well be more meaningful than any uh, just a Saturday event that you did with your company. Uh, cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I loved no. I loved it. Uh, I loved it. And I, I taught English to kids. I never thought that I would be able to connect with children because uh, you know I'm the youngest in my family. There's no kids in my family, but it was super fun, super super meaningful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a good question by Gaurav again. Gaurav is the same guy who asked us about he has a 760 early early career and he wants to know whether the score will work later. So he's asking us now, what, what is quality work experience? Because the schools all say we want quality over quantity. We don't want you five years. But even if you have two years work experience, we want it to be good quality. Can you comment on this? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, it can mean a lot of things. I think, uh, you know, so long as you had, um, uh, I mean, it's hard to see. I, I don't want to say anything that will be, you know, uh, shutting people out. But I think anybody who has a job at a firm or not, I mean, not even a firm, it can be, you can be auto entrepreneur. I think quality work experience is something that actually is work. Um, and there's so many things that would fit into this category. I'm sure even freelancer would fit into this category. Um, I think the work experience is really uh, a, a trade, an expertise that you have, something, some skills that you've used and that you've um, developed with with experience. That you've been able to um, solve problems, you've been able to help people, you've been able to, uh, you know, make a living with something that will be your 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 skills, your work, your. Um, uh, line of expertise i think that 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 will be quality work experience okay yeah uh cool thanks god of thanks clemens um question from rahul um you can quickly cover that what is the what should be the target gmat score for the t10 mba uh so rahul do you already have an mba okay i think um if you, I mean, the ideal GMAT score, I think, you know, there's no, there's no ideal because you can always make up with the rest of your applications. Um, I think a, a competitive GMAT score is something that will be around the average of the class or around the 80% the, the median, you know? So if you look at the median, I don't know if, uh, uh, say, Harvard or, or Warren, those schools are, you know, around 730 or 720, it depends. Um, and you're, you're around there, I think that's a competitive GMAT score. But uh, I think, it, you know, once you have that, I, I don't think it's necessarily important to go get that 770 or go get that 780. I think it's good to work on other areas of your applications, um, do volunteer work if you can, if you have the possibility to do so. Uh, work with your recommenders, work on your essays. Um, There's so many things other than the GMAT that you can do once you have a, a you know, what I think is a competitive score. Okay. Um, yeah, we have one minute left, so, uh, and that's why I'll ask a question of my own. Okay, what did you show in the favorite data visualization question of MIT? You might have been asked that before your interview. Oh, I love this. This was actually my favorite question of all the process because um, this was something I, I, I did at work. I, I worked on a, in a private, uh, so in the private sector, uh, I guess in private, um, how do you say, in private markets, when you price loans, there's very little uh, you know, market information. Uh, there's little, you know, data uh, discovery. So I built a, a loan uh, pricing uh, build-up model. I was basically using, uh, you know, different characteristics of, of loan. For example, um, uh, the location. For example, the um, merchant. Um, uh, so 
in a power plant. Uh, and to give you a little bit of uh, background on the project finance space, uh, power plants can have a percent of their revenue that is merchant. That would be equivalent to having commodity risk, basically. Um, and some are fully contracted and those are less risky. So this component played a, a big role in the pricing model that I built. Also, Tenor was a, you know, a component of the pricing model. The longer the loan, the more expensive the loan. The longer dated the loan, the more expensive the loan usually is. Um, so I built a model and I showed in my data visualization, I showed the, you know, on the X axis, I would put the, you know, the, the price and the Y axis, I would put the merchant um, percentage in, in the power plant. And it would sh basically, you know, show a strong correlation between the, you know, the percentage of merchant risk or the commodity risk, electricity, be, if you consider electricity a commodity, then it'll be commodity risk. Um, so I just did those graphs to show how I came up with the idea of the of the model, of the pricing model using those different. Um, and I considered one factor because it's much easier to do a graph with one factor and, and showing the correlation. And it was fine. I think um, it was just to, to illustrate a component of this of this model. So I think data visual visualization is great uh, exercise, and so long as you have some examples, it's, it's good. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, you were obviously very passionate about that. It is scary for people like me with non finance background, but I think <laughs> we can all find something from our work or our hobbies to show about. It need not be about loan modeling. Okay, cool. Yeah, we are, so we are at the end of time. Uh, thank you so much for doing this, Clemens. We usually have hundreds of people watching this throughout the rest of the year on YouTube. Um, so I'm sure it's going to be really helpful for a lot of people. It's thank so, you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Tejas. Love the questions. Thank you so much for all who connected. It was super interesting uh, to connect uh, and to talk about this uh, experience. Feel free to reach out to me on GMAT Club. Uh, my um, handle is Clemens Martin, C-L-E-M-E-N-S, Martin, M-A-R-T-N, all uh, in one word. Feel free to connect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.